and they call me Mr. Flip Phone. So it took me a while to get the uh, technology down, but we finally did. Um, and thanks to the efforts of the whole reunion committee, uh, we were able to get this going. So the first thing I want to do is just to introduce uh, the members of the committee. Uh, we're calling ourselves the uh, Buckeye Council Camp Staff Reunion Committee, and we're expanding out into other things as well. We've also adopted the, uh, the name of the Polecat Patrol, as you may have seen in some of our uh, letters and things. So uh, in no particular order, I'm gonna call them out and they can uh, say hi and, and you can see who they are. Ralph Tolston. Hi. There you go, Jerry Duffy. Hi everyone. There you go, yeah, this is not many age order, just saying. Um, Mark Miller. Hey, be prepared. There you go, Grant Ryder. Present. Okay, Nathan Douglas. Howdy. Ben Senf. Senf. Hello, hello. Okay, uh, Chris Altman, but he's not here tonight. He's not feeling well. Uh, Kevin Powell. Hello, everybody. Great. Brian Linder, uh, who was, uh, oh, good. Jan saying hello from, from Norfolk. Uh, Brian was here last night presenting. I don't think he's going to be here this evening. Uh, Steve Ernst uh, is our arranger. Um, I don't see him on tonight, but he'll probably join us later. Ray Cap. I, I wouldn't have been on this committee if I knew Duffy was on it. That's all I want to say. <laughs> and so it begins. Uh, and Dave, 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 okay, this is the high sign, guys. Uh, Dave Schanauer is the last of our, of our committee members. Uh, he also has to be at a, uh, a family function tonight, so he was here last night. Um, so these are the guys we've been working with to plan both the real reunion, which we are planning on having in September, and more on that in a bit. And they've also been helping out with uh, this reunion and with all the projects that we've been uh, been doing, which I'm going to tell you about. So our real purpose here tonight is just number one, uh, provide some connectivity so you guys can get a chance to see each other in a format that maybe you haven't had before. Um, see people from your own era, also see people from different eras. I, I'm really, really glad to see more of the uh, seven range uh, staff group here tonight and uh, they'll all have a chance to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more. So we thank you guys for, for coming and joining us tonight. Um, one of our big goals in this uh, virtual reunion and also in our September reunion is to really bring together um, the staff from all of the camps and all of the eras um, as one, one family of, of campers and one camp family of brothers and sisters. So um, the other thing is to take a little bit of time and explore some of our common history. And so we'll have some presentations I'll tell you about in just a minute. Uh, also to fill you in on uh, exciting projects that we have done and are planning on doing. Um, and the other big thing here is to uh, find our missing members and get everybody up to date in our database. Um, so I'll talk about that first. We now have an official site, uh, and as I go through some of the stuff, Nathan's going to be putting it up on the screen for you guys. Um, we have a camp staff alumni site, um, and we have started a, uh, uh, a uh, database in there. So if you, there's the site right there, www.campstaffalumni.org. If you have not gone on to that particular site and updated your information, please do so. There's a link on there that says update info. Even if you gave us your info at the last reunion or if you've been getting other emails, please go on and do that because that's going to be the central uh, database for everybody. Um, and uh, uh, so, and we promise you that uh, the only thing it's going to be used for is going to be to keep you up to date and to, uh, we will be talking donations, but only for projects that we as a camp staff alumni group are doing. Uh, we're not going to turn your names over to any other organization. We're not going to have anybody calling you for capital campaigns funds. No one's going to track you down. We're not going to sell the list to people. And you won't have Alexa or Siri bothering you at any point in time with regards to conversations we had here. So please do that. And also please help us to track down other staff members who we may not have. Grant, you want to say a few words on that? Well, we've got that list and there's been, I'll, I'll tell you, it's a real gratification when you can say, I was able to track down a certain staff member who'd uh, perhaps fallen off the face of the earth. I probably have found about a dozen to 15 people over the years. And uh, once that list gets published, um, look at it, please examine it. Look for your fellow staff members that were on the staff the year that you were or the years that you were there and 
try and figure out who's missing from the list. A lot of times you may not have a connection with them. You might remember that they were very close friends with another staff member that you do have contact with. So we want to try and reconnect with as many of our past staff members as possible. And the only way we can do it is a, a joint effort. Good. Thanks, Grant. Um, I think, Nathan, do we have that list of, of names we were going to put up or make it available? Uh, there you go. So that's a list of the names of the people we have on our list currently. So you can later on, you can download that list or copy it or whatever you can go through. Uh, and if you see names that are missing or don't see names that are missing, obviously, then you can get a hold of them. You can pass the information on to any one of the committee here um, and uh, get, them, get them on our list. We really want to make this as comprehensive as possible so we can get the word out. Um, Brian? Yeah. Brian, I uh, communicated by email today with Fred Gray, and he said he couldn't participate, but he said I should say howdy from Fred. Fred so. There we go. There we go. Great. Um, Brian? Yes. I have a question about the database. Yes. It's, uh, somewhat, it's somewhat frustrating that when you uh, go there, it only gives you an opportunity to edit your data. You can't really check what you've already got in there. And you also can't look at it to see who is and isn't on there. Okay. So could, can we facilitate that? Uh, Nathan, can I address that? So that is a Google form. And um, there's a lot of sensitive information in that, like addresses, phone numbers. Uh, I can probably do an updated list and just shrink it down and then put a link out um, for, the, for the partial part of it. So you okay. can go back and look and see who is there. Uh, what about this question of updating your information? So uh, is that that's easy to do and to navigate through? If you put your information in more than once, and I, when I do the sort, if you're in there twice, I'll and it tells me when it was updated. I'll kick out the one that was okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Thank you. Like like I just noticed, Bob Schwartz is in there twice. Is Robert and Bob, and mm -hmm. so I'll check the one that's okay. The Great. newest. Thank you. Check it out. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. Just a note on that. We used to have just an Excel spreadsheet, and that was a lot easier. I, well, I, yeah, it is and it isn't. Um, so the nice this thing actually about all goes into Excel, into a, like a Google Doc. Yeah. Um, so a sheet doc. Yeah. So and and it's nice having you on the one site here. Um, anyway, we we did a particular reason. And I think it's really working out for us. Um, so let me get you up to date on a few things, and then we'll start our first presentation. We're going to have two maybe twenty minute presentations here. Uh, but before we do that, um, if you haven't seen it already, we have uh, been starting the Upward Trail, which is kind of a, a regular um, newsletter, uh, maybe every couple months, uh, and it talks about the projects that we're doing. Um, it's uh, it uh, gives you some links on there. It also um, has a featured, we have a featured staff member each in each edition, and we're rotating around our staff members. So we'll have a Buckeye staffer, a Seven Range, a Tuscazor, a, a McKinley, whatever. So uh, each time we'll feature a different person, and uh, you can find out what some of your friends are up to uh, and some interesting facts about them. Um, we also, as I mentioned, we started the Polecat Patrol from the old Polecat song. The purpose of that is to coordinate uh, good turns on behalf of the staff alum group. Um, we, uh, our, one of our first projects was uh, helping the Tuscazar Foundation to build the stockade by, uh, by sponsoring one of the uprights in the stockade. Um, and we had some, some great contributions to that. Our next project is going to be uh, a gateway entrance at seven ranges. Um, and uh, that's something we've looked at. Nathan's gonna put up a little diagram here um, the, uh, yeah, here it's coming. It's, uh, designed, uh, based on the bridge builder theme. That was the transition theme from seven ranges to Tuscaloosa or Tuscaloosa seven ranges. And it's still kind of the staff, uh, theme there. It's uh, meant to look like, a, a um, arch trestle bridge, uh, with the two pillars on the side and the gate represents the trestle across. Um, the gates are, uh, steel, uh, powder coated. Um, and, uh, you notice the two lanterns on the top there. Um, if many of you might remember that uh, in at Tuscazor, somewhere in the f late 40s or 50s, we haven't figured out exactly when yet, two large lanterns, gas lanterns, were purchased from Ehlers General Store 
to help light the uh, parade grounds, especially on Friday nights when campers came back from a uh, pipestone ceremony. Those were brought over to seven ranges um, when we packed everything up and brought it over. And they've also been used up until fairly recently on Friday nights as well. But they've come, kind of fallen into a state of disrepair. Um, we were thinking about having them refurbished but uh, and repurposed as electric lamps, but we didn't want to uh, destroy the integrity of the lamp. So instead, uh, we've had them cleaned up and uh, painted, and they are going to be uh, hung in the dining hall um, on either side of the fireplace, mounted on brackets on the two upward pillars there. And uh, the, there'll be a plaque there explaining what they are and where they came from. But the lamps that on the gate that you saw in the picture, uh, oh, Bill's got a raised hand, so I'll call him one second here. Um, the uh, lamps you see on the picture are uh, replica lamps that we found that are uh, electric. And so they will be placed on top of the gate uh, into, yeah, there's a picture of Nathan there holding up one of the, the original lamps. Um, and that's kind of where it'll be mounted and hung in the dining hall there. There'll be a plaque below. On the actual pillars of the entrance to the gate, uh, we're gonna have plaques as well. Um, and for people who are sponsors on various levels. And uh, there'll also be a large uh, poster um, with uh, plexiglass enclosed that'll list the names of all the sponsors, but the major ones will, will go on the actual gateway itself. We have a contractor on the archway itself and on the, the lamps are taken care of. Um, and we've got several mason contractors who are currently bidding for us to do the uh, stone and the uh, stonework for the whole thing. Um, we estimate that the, uh, hey Dan, we estimate that the, the cost is going to be somewhere in the $18,000 range. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, start a fundraising uh, campaign for this. Our plan is to actually begin construction sometime in the late summer or the fall so that we can use the summertime to um, uh, boost the project and promote the project, and especially with the campers coming through camp and help to get donations. So you'll be, you'll be seeing more on that uh, in the coming months um, on that project. So uh, Billy, you had a question. Yes, is there any thought given to electrifying those lanterns in the dining hall? You know, uh, not the ones in the dining hall, only because of the fact that they're, they're uh, we, we don't want to do anything more that's going to jeopardize them. They're pretty old. Um, Okay. Nathan, Nathan spent a good amount of time uh, looking at them, and we figured the best thing we can do is to uh, get them back to their original color and touch them up. Does that sound about right, Nathan? Yeah, the retrofit kits for those were like 250 bucks a piece yeah. um, and then, in there, and uh, just the condition of them and the fact that we would, in order to retrofit, have to drill through the original, um, the, the part that holds the fuel. Right. Uh, we didn't we didn't want to damage them so we did send them out for powder coating and um, they should actually be back by now i'm getting getting ready to get them hung out there uh, Yay. by may thanks bill um yeah that was the big thing was trying to protect them um they used them for as, as long as they could use them in seven ranges but in the last couple of years they i don't think they've been able to, to have them they've been kind of mounted temporarily on on uh, posts out there um after this project, we are looking at other projects in uh, uh, at McKinley and Tuscaloosa Seven Ranges. We're going to try to to benefit all the uh, the camps that are that are still in use in various ways. Um, so you'll see more information on that. Um, and one thing I was also asked to uh, to do tonight by Chris Altman is not here is to um, plug the uh, Tuscaloosa Foundation um, for those of you who. Uh, are familiar with Tuscaloosa and have camped there. It is certainly for us the kind of the seat or the or the the, the beginning of the tradition for us. Um, and we will be planning on having our, our reunion at Tuscaloosa again. Um, however, uh, we are also planning um, or thinking about possibilities of doing things over the weekend at Seven Ranges as well. So um, so we're working on that particular plan. We want to be able to feature both camps and we want everybody to feel comfortable in both places. But if you're not familiar with the, with the Tuscaloosa Foundation, um, that's something you want to check out. There's a Facebook page that they have. Um, Ralph is also on the, or associated with the foundation, I believe. Is that right, Ralph? Or have been, maybe kind of adjunctly. Oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> First time. <laughs> just a donor. <laughs> oh, just a donor, okay. So uh, you, can, you can Google it, uh, Camp Tuscaloosa Foundation. Um, 
And uh, if you're interested, you can you can rent campsites in there, uh, all kinds of stuff. When we come back in September for our reunion, which we're planning on doing, uh, we will be kind of spread out over the camp. Uh, we are still planning on having the reunion. Um, we're also keeping uh, our finger on the pulse of what's going on uh, with regards to the pandemic and with regards to with, with regulations and, and everything else. So um, we will uh, keep you all apprised as we go through on that. But that is the plan still to have the, the uh, reunion at, at Tuscazor and then to spend some time at Seven Ranges as well while we're there. So. Um, I think that keeps us up to date. Anybody on the committee that I missed here as far as our announcements are concerned? Anything? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. Good. Then I think what we'll do is we'll move into the uh, second half of our presentation here. Um, and so um, we have two short 20 minute presentations here on historical perspectives. Uh, and so for the first presentation, um, we're going to have uh, Kirk Albrecht and, and Ray Cap. Uh, talking about preserving some of our traditions. And then we're gonna turn it over to uh, uh, Nathan Douglas um, and Jer Jerry Duffy also is gonna be uh, involved in this. And then turn it over to Nathan Douglas and to Jerry and talk about some of the transitions from uh, uh, Buckeye Tuscazor into Seven Ranges. So Ray, the floor is yours. Hi kids, nice to see everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, uh, Jerry and I and Kirk brainstormed some um, traditions we've got well, I don't know, a dozen that we've thought of, but uh, we want to uh, seed the group a little bit with one or two, and then uh, just see what you remember from those days. Um, let me start by suggesting that, um, man, I've been to a hundred different camps over the years uh, in my scouting uh, career, and as far as I know, um, Tuscazor in those days, and even to this day at Seven Ranges, it's the only place, uh, only council in America that asks you to tie a knot to get into supper. And um, as far as I know, it's the only place, uh, and I've been to lots of camps, um, that uh, to get out of the dining hall, you have to sing Trail the Eagle. So uh, those are two traditions that I think have persisted for since the time of, uh, well, when, when Bernie Myers was on staff in 1925. So I think... Um, We've got almost 100 years of tradition uh, with those two. And uh, I'll shut up and maybe Kirk and Jerry have one they'd like to throw in and we'll see yeah. what happens. I've got one. Um, how many of you remember your first year pipe when you get your first year, year pipe stone and uh, sleeping with it clutched in your fist, at least I did all night. <laughs> and uh, that morning at breakfast, uh, well, you know, eyeballing it all morning, but uh, Taking it to breakfast, and uh, I learned to use nose grease, I guess, was better for polishing your pipe stone than uh, butter was. I always thought it was uh, uh, a better uh, shine on the pipe stone. So. Yeah, well, the other Saturday morning um, tradition was to see who showed up with the most red uh, burnt sienna temper on their body. <laughs> Uh -huh. Who was the winner? Yeah, that was the badge of honor in the morning. <laughs> I know some troops like to send their scouts in with white shirts on to uh, find out afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say that in, right. in several of my years there, we kind of discouraged that practice on the part of the scout masters. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's not traditional. No, I know. <laughs> so uh, is Kirk on here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to around. throw in uh, a few thoughts about Bucky's Pond. Oh. Um, a small but very prominent feature at Camp Buck. Um, what most people don't remember or know, because it predates most of us, is that when Bucky's Pond was first constructed, that was the camp swimming pool. Um, that's pretty rough uh, uh, swimming uh, these days. Uh, it's, it's been drained and dredged a couple times. Uh, nothing very exciting came out of it other than a whole lot of mud. Um, uh, it, the, the actual swimming pool wasn't built until the 50s uh, and was a decided improvement over Bucky's Pond. Now, um, 
as I remember, occasionally the life saving tests uh, were actually done in the pond rather than the pond. Uh, an interesting twist of things. Um, probably the, the most fun that I know of that's been had on, on Viking Pond was uh, the building and, and floating in a coracle. In case anybody doesn't know what a coracle is, it's a ring of sort of roughly interwoven brush, and you, take, you set that in a, in a big donut, and then you set that on a on a, on a canvas part. Hopefully, it's had some waterproofing, and then you fold you fold the corners of the tarp in over, and then you get in the the, the coracle and row about. Now, you can't roll a coracle, to be honest. Uh, all you do is go in big loops around by these um, You know, um, Bucky's Pond, I remember a big uh, camp staff OA project um, in the mid 70s. We actually had to find some, some clay soil uh, from other parts of camp haul it in and <laughs> repack the outside of the dam because it was leaking significantly. Um, but uh, what a prominent feature of Camp Buck. Uh, and on the upper side, the little spring that came in and along the, let's see, as you stand at this shower house and face the pool, um, uh, the spring there uh, to your right, back, back to your right, um, always had the most marvelous crop of um, wild watercress. And it was a fairly well kept secret, but occasionally the camp staff would have um, special salad. Uh, and well, some of our traditions were homemade. Uh, one of my favorite is Ralph uh, playing his bugle, uh, doing follow me boys into the pool uh, at Tuscazor. And uh, I think it was follow me boys. I don't remember, but the visual is just striking. And then of course, uh, at that pool, we played water polo. That uh, became a very popular uh, sport and a, a real way to integrate <laughs> the new members the new staff members really um, somehow bore the brunt of the uh, older guys in that. But uh, Jerry Pickman almost Google. killed me twice there, Ray. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I can still see Ralph playing his bugle, going through the pool. I don't know how you kept up, Ralph. Maybe you have a maybe you have a secret you want to tell us. No, I, I I don't have anything to s say as as to how I did it. I just enjoyed doing it, and, <laughs> yeah, and it started true. out the, the first year it was Follow Me Boys. Um, I actually so, saw the movie Follow Me Boys as soon as it came out, and then I wrote to the Disney company to get the sheet music, and and we used it that year. But then, in subsequent years, we used different songs as the staff song, but it all uh, ended up in the pool. <laughs> I noticed you were very, very uh, uh, relieved in our last reunion at Tuscazor to find out that the pool had been filled in, Ralph. So. <laughs> yeah. um, just to, to jump in on real quick, the tradition continued on because Chaplain John also picked up on that um, in uh, later years and did that. And later, Brian Linder, who was capped uh, bugler, also did that. So uh, we, we kept that tradition going. Any of the of the Seven Rangers guys, I know when, I, when we came over in, in uh, 87, we didn't, uh, we didn't, do that particular tradition, but has, has it been brought up at Seven Ranges? Does anybody uh, march into any of the ponds and at Seven Ranges with Bugle? Anybody? Anybody? No. Okay. Well, I don't think it's yeah, smarter uh, now. We have a waterfront emergency, so. Uh, okay. Someone said we're smart. I try and get some auto water basketry started <laughs> every year, but that's about it. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, uh, Seven Ranges side. Dave Souls didn't exactly march in with a bugle, but he gained a reputation for jumping into the bass pond in his Class A uniform. So that became a thing. Maybe it morphed slightly. I'm not sure. Okay. 
I think he still does that to this day. Good. Well, some traditions carry over in new ways. I like that. Well, well, I remember Chaplain John's uh, VW floating in that pool one year. <laughs> There's not much more room. <laughs> I don't know you have how. Have anything to do with that, John? Uh, I just remember seeing it, so yeah. I'm not <laughs> <admitting> <laughs> it. plausible <laughs> deniability. It's like <laughs> it's like the reamer. Right? I had nothing yeah. to do with the reamer. Yeah, the reamer. They may not know what the reamer is, John. Well, I don't think the, re the reamer lasted for about two weeks before Bernie shut it down or Ray did. I don't know who did. Oh but no! Basically, it it was a line from. Uh, it was a line going down. We made a down signal to, tower. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Ray. You're gonna. We describe. made a signal tower with a zip line before zip lines were popular, and uh, it ended up in a large uh, black oak tree. That's right. And, well, there was no way to avoid smashing into the tree, and um, yes. kids wanted yes. to do it. Yeah, and Bernie found that objectionable. And, and I <laughs> after several broken bones and gouts that had to go home. Uh, I was um, going to say, I think the third trip to the hospital did it. Yeah, <laughs> but we only had a, a stick to uh, ride the reamer with on a zip line. So. <laughs> yeah. well, I see, Dave Wagner got smarter later on and did it with a giant inner tube. So there you go. He just yeah. bounced off the tree. And so didn't save him. No, I didn't. He still, still broke, broke his leg or whatever it was. You know, one of the traditions uh, that has continued from Tuscazor through Buckeye and on to Seven Ranges is the use of uh, the cannon at, um, at uh, retreat. Uh, that, you know, that doesn't happen at every camp in America either. Uh, but it's absolutely a delightful tradition and something uh, unique to us, really. I'm glad it continues. <laughs> I, I have I was two, talking two. I was talking about that cannon with CJ actually the other day and as far as we are aware we are the only camp in the country that is still allowed to fire a cannon. Yeah. Really? So Don um, you're gonna say something? Yeah I have two real short stories. One uh, you know we probably have some traditions around visitors night, parents night, mm -hmm. which at Camp Buckeye <laughs> in sixty one was Wednesday night and uh, one uh, skit that I would do uh, with another fella is at the swimming pool. I'd uh, pretend to be a plumber trying to fix a leak in the swimming pool. So I would go out on the diving board with a poncho so I wouldn't get wet and dive in the pool with a, like a 30 inch long huge wrench and go down and pretend, you know, I fixed it. So that, that was one thing that got a big reaction from the parents. But the other thing about the retreats at night uh, with a cannon. At Buckeye, we had this little short, uh, maybe it was uh, two feet long cannon that was only like 12 inches high. And um, let's, let's see, I think it was Henry Bunning, the camp quartermaster, would, uh, ran out of uh, blank shells for that cannon. You know, it used shotgun shells. And so he started using regular shells uh, shotgun shells with uh, shot in them and he would aim them for this one big poplar tree over to the east and you know we all lined up the staff on one side and the boys would uh, scouts would line up on the other side and we were on the south side uh, near the tree and son of a gun those uh, shotgun pellets would uh, ricochet off and was hitting some of us so we would complain, but he, he kept it up. So they said, you do that, you keep that up. Uh, next time the pellets hit us, we're all gonna fall down. And um, somebody leaked the story to the boys. Anyway, we all fell down, played dead, and the boys just charged us. So the, you know, there was 180 boys or so. They just ran across the uh, parade ground there and jumped on us and all laying there. And I had the misfortune of having among the boys jumping on me was one little brat who had a safety pin, who was uh, jabbing me with that to, so I couldn't play dead anymore. I wanted to kill him, but I didn't. <laughs> but, hey, Andy, I think I saw you had your hand up for a second there. Are you, are you there? Yeah, I did. I actually just wanted to simply say that also a tradition surrounding the canon is not telling the first years about it. I uh, guess, and watching them jump six inches. You beat me to that punch. 
Yeah. Um, I know somebody has more information than I do, probably Kurt, but the cannon that was at uh, Tuscazar was one of the McKinley cannons that was from the McKinley administration. Uh, isn't that correct, Mark Miller? I'm pretty sure. No, actually, that was from the Duber Hampton. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, traditionally, the story is that it was McKinley's parade cannon. Uh -huh. but, that's, but with a lot of research, we've determined that not to be true. Oh, okay. But, Good. Truth or not. Duber Hampton Watchworks had two cannons. Um, and George Deaver, uh, when the Watchworks was sold, he has a, uh, roughly above uh, where Klingstedt's, uh, Klingstedt Brothers Printing is, Castler's place um, in, in, um, in the park down there. It used to be uh, Mother Goose Park. Um, anyways, um, there were two cannons. The, the Duber Hampton Watchworks was sold to a Russian concern. And in the, in the handover, George Deaver one night slipped in and um, let's just say he appropriated one of the cannons. <laughs> and he uh, admitted uh, years later that he had wished he had gotten the second one at the same time. Uh, that's that's the true background on that. Great. So it's not McKinley's. It looks a lot like <laughs> a great cannon that would have been McKinley's, but it's really it's actually a historical piece of uh, major cannon history. Does anybody know any of the history of the smaller cannon that was at Buckeye? No. I don't. Um, I know kidnapping each other's camps. Cannons was a, a popular staff pastime. It was for a while. <laughs> on the Buckeye Cannon, uh, and I, I'm vague on the details and I may mangle this, but think, think Charlie Scalabrino out of is it Group 81 out of New Philly had something to do with it. I think the, the story is that. Um, he was camping at Tuscazora, was well aware of the Tuscazora cannon. They took a year at Buckeye uh, after the merger, um, was, was missing the cannon as part of retreat and came up with it. If it wasn't Charlie, it was somebody else um, from that era of New Philly. That sounds like Charlie. Yeah. Uh, Andy, you had your hand one more time? I get it. Yeah, I had a question about the weather rock. Um, my, my dad tells me that back in the 80s, it was almost scripted that someone was going to steal the weather rock and demand something that was already going to happen, like we have to have jello cake for dinner for dessert, and then they would return the weather rock, weather rock. But when I was on staff, that turned into a big problem, and the senior directors were always upset that some troops were going to steal the weather rock, and I don't understand. It seems to have morphed into something toxic. So I'm wondering where that tradition came from of someone stealing it as part of the program, how that originated. Well, I don't know uh, about that, but I know that I made the, I think the original one. In uh, 1971. And, yeah, and it's still, uh, I guess I'm old because when I went to the museum there in the parking lot, uh, they've got the original blue painting I did. And I remember, um, my dad worked in the cement business and I found a piece of sandstone and I was the nature director one year and, uh, or maybe several years, but, uh, so I found this piece of sandstone and I was, I brought it home over the weekend to of course have my laundry clean and then drill a hole in the rock so we could suspend it. And, uh, I'm hacking away about midnight with a chisel in the backyard. And my father came out and he thought I was out of my mind and, uh, he showed me how you could use a drill with a concrete bit to go through that, and we got it done in about 10 minutes. Uh, so anyway, we brought it back, and uh, Bruce uh, Carter did a, um, you know, a, a loop in the, uh, did a splice. Uh, what's that loop that I can't remember? We were teaching the kids. The, the loop you do it. The eye splice. The eye splice, yeah. We did an eye splice through the hole and hung it up, and then... Uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I think that was 1971. Who said that? Was that Grant? Uh, yeah. Grant. Yeah. 
Yep. Now, now, Jerry Duffy and I have a tradition that we talked about uh, many times, and that is we thought, uh, of course, uh, Bernie was camp director many of the years when, when, uh, when Jerry and I were there. And we thought we were the only one Bernie hated. And what we found out <laughs> um, years later is everybody thought Bernie hated him. <laughs> that was his power. Somehow, he, yeah, it was magical. I thought I was the only one. Jerry thought he was. Uh, you know, John Weesey thought he was the only one. It was really funny. Uh, well, um, I know you probably have some, some more things here. I, I want to keep things moving because we have another presentation. Um, uh, we've, we've, we'll have some more stories at the real reunion. Yes, we'll have some more stories, and and uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk about a few things later on too about other options we have here to keep this story going. Um, we have a lot of our seven range brothers uh, on tonight too, and uh, so Nathan's next presentation is going to be talking about um, kind of moving the traditions into uh, into seven ranges and a little bit of the history there. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Nathan, and uh, we'll have some more discussion on this, and then we'll move into our third part. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I'm going to read through just kind of what I put together. Um, one of my goals has always been to create a book, if you will, um, of the history of Seven Ranges. You know, that has been our council camp for more than 30 years now. And um, I would just hate for that history to be lost. And unfortunately, I'm starting to see uh, a large majority of that happening. I've reached out to several uh, folks who were on camping committees and who were part of the council at the time and, um, you know, whether their, their fathers were parts of that. And um, I know one of them, um, I believe I reached out to a while back was Mr. Moyer and he's like, it's gone. And it was my dad's notes, you know, what we could make sense of didn't make sense. And so, you know, um, one of the things that I did happen to come across, though, as I was talking to Steve Ernst about this was, he was like, oh, I got a three ring binder here in my office that's got like 50 pages in it that talks about the history of um, when Buckeye Council actually started to go through and um, look at the feasibility of starting a new camp. Um, and ironically, that was done as early as October of 1968. Uh, they started to do, there was some concerns over uh, the growing number of scouts and the adequacy to the council camps, um, Buckeye and Tuscazor as to how they were able to uh, continue with those scouts. And so during the summer of 68, here's a little bit of uh, facts for you. Um, there were 1,300 campers and 144 staff members and leaders that attended Camp Tuscazor and 824 campers and 106 leaders and staff that attended Camp Buckeye. Um, both camps had been filled to the capacity during this time, and both facilities uh, at that time were actually deemed to be completely inadequate uh, for expansion and for long-range planning. Um, so a committee was formed to start to look at the purchase of new land. Um, as the committee began their search, they discovered many of the criteria um, of what they were looking for, uh, one being to hold three 200-acre camps, um, large enough to provide a campsite for 10 to 20 uh, adult leaders, their families. And here's something that I found was really funny. It said, so the leader's family may vacation while he takes the troop to camp. So in other words, they wanted the wife with the kids who were not old enough to go to camp. And I ran this past a good friend of mine, a scoutmaster last night after uh, we had gotten a blast from being able to go to Philmont this summer um, about the, all of family opportunities there are at Philmont. And uh, both of our wives were hard pass. No, we're not, we're not doing that. So um, even as far then they were trying to make that happen. And I, I just found that really funny. Um, they also <laughs> believed at the time that it enticed good scoutmasters into camp um, so that their family could go to camp uh, while they were also at camp. Um, part of that all uh, was building a rifle range uh, for skeet shooting um, an archery and uh, a lake for boating and water skiing, uh, among many other features and assets for the necessary parts of a property uh, that would facilitate year-round camping. Um, so while this search was going on, uh, council actually had acquired a tract of land, um, about 1,060 acres that was uh, near Salt Fork Lake, uh, near Cambridge, Ohio. Um, that property uh, 
was looked at to cost about $1.9 million at the time, um, which you think in, you know, the late 60s, um, in the 70s, that's, it's a huge number. Um, but the capital campaign just, it didn't pan out. Um, and so by the time they were ready to do it in 77, they were looking at $2.7 million. Um, so the Camping and Engineer Service of the Boy Scouts of America had actually set forth a criteria um, for which a new camp property should include along with diagrams of what they felt was uh, an effective camp um, property as well as sites for patrol camping as they called it at the time, uh, much like we do today. Um, so in 78 though, uh, Council Camping Committee and the subcommittee entitled Buckeye Camps is what the subcommittee was called, um, concluded that the council should purchase and redevelop 522 acres outside of Camp Buckeye. Um, with that knowledge that the property may not be available for another decade or better, um, with a cost of approximately $465,000. Um, it was soon realized though that that was not going to be an ultimate solution, knowing that if they did get that land and redevelop the land, that within 10 to 20 years, they would have outgrown that property already. So um, you think a 30 year term, it wasn't gonna work out. Um, you know, Tuscazor was explored for additional property um, and uh, the topography of Tuscazor uh, did not work out due to, um, they wanted to make sure that the, there were additional water wells, um, but the high walls did not fit in with national standards um, to be able to put some of those pieces in that they were looking for. Um, and one of the things that they ran into with the Buckeye properties that they wanted to get a hold of is that the owners weren't ready to sell or wanting to even think about looking at selling their properties. So um, the Winterset property was eventually sold. Um, that was the property that was actually purchased down near Salt Fork um, due to the lack of community support. And um, on June 18th, 1978, uh, Jeffrey H. Smythe, a uh, realtor um, from the Chagrin Falls area, uh, contacted that committee um, regarding the Donna Haven tree farm. Uh, it was a property that was about 900 acres south of Kensington. Um, the committee set out on a three-hour tour, and it literally says we have experienced a three-hour tour of this property. Um, uh, in September 2nd of 1978, and it was agreed by the entire committee that the property had great potential uh, to become the next scout reservation for the council. Um, the property acquisition was set in place, and after a review of the land and um, one of the things that was done was evaluation of the tree farm um, and how the tree farm could operate as uh, revenue for the council um, and what the actual stock on the tree farm was worth. Uh, it was agreed upon of an asking price of about $1.3 million. Um, so after several meetings with Mr. Donahue, um, the actual agreed price uh, for a total of $928,000 um, payable over Nathan, a four year period. Yeah. Nathan, I'm gonna stop. S somebody on our line here has got your, your microphone on and we're hearing your family noises. So if you can mute that microphone, I can't tell who it is. Oh, that sounds better. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Nathan, sorry. This is getting to be a little bit of a distraction. So um, a final agreed upon price for $928,000 was going to be paid over four years to Mr. Donahue. Um, and then it was basically budgeted out that uh, an additional $666,360 would be put into for camp development of what we now know as Seven Ranges and its properties. So that's uh, what I have come up with and how uh, Seven Ranges came to be. Um, Mr. Donahue uh, at the time had actually known that his family wasn't going to want to pursue any of the property um, or want any of the property. So he had Mr. Smythe contact uh, the council knowing that they were in search of property. Interesting. So there you go. I'm going to, I'm going to add on to the tack on to that. Um, in the last few years, when we knew that we were moving from Tuscaloosa or seven ranges, the big, big question at that point in time was, how do we affect this uh, this this transition smoothly? And uh, Dave Durrell, uh, who was camp director for the last year of seven of Tuscaloosa, the first year at Seven Ranges, 
um, started a plan uh, and he got commitments from almost all the program directors uh, to do to commit themselves to two years, one year at uh, Tuscaloosa, last year at Tuscaloosa, and the first year at Seven Ranges. Um, and we began uh, two years before the move even started um, with meetings um, and, uh, and learning the history of the place, um, trying to figure out you know, how we would, uh, we would ease people's concerns about the transition, um, talked about traditions and which ones we felt we could move and which ones we didn't want to mess with and which ones we felt were better just to kind of let develop on their own. Um, and it was Dave Durrell who came up, uh, who found the poem, The Bridge Builder, um, uh, by Will Allen Dromgul. Will Allen Dromgul is actually a, a, a pen name. The, the, the author is actually a woman, but she couldn't get her, her uh, poems published under her own name, so she published them under a male name. Uh, and the Bridge Builder poem was there. It was a poem that was a favorite of my dad's, and uh, he shared it with, with Dave a number of years earlier, and Dave remembered it. And so he brought the Bridge Builder poem, and uh, that was read in the dining hall at Seven Rain or at Tuscaloosa in the last year as a extended uh, thought for the day. Um, and it became the theme of the transition staff from Tuscaloosa to Seven Ranges, and it, it stayed with the staff. Um, I believe it's still the the, uh, the term that's used in Seven Ranges of Bridge Builders. Um, the amphitheater at Seven Ranges is the Bridge Builder Amphitheater. Um, so, uh, and uh, so a, a number of traditions kind of grew out of that, which is one of the reasons why we chose that that uh, visual for the shape and the and the formation of the gate at Seven Ranges because of the tie-in with the Bridge Builders. So, so anyway, back to you, Nathan. Hello, we lost Nathan. I was just muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much all I had uh, for this evening. Are there any questions off of what I shared or anything I can try to find for you? Uh, Nathan, I, if I can just give you a little background. Um, you've got the sanitized version. There is a whole lot more to those stories. Um, I understand that. We're not oh, yeah. going <laughs> to... Yeah, yeah, we, we were trying to kind of keep it the, the Cliff's Notes version. <laughs> I was on the camping committee, the, the council finance committee, the camp development committee, and the executive board in that. Um, so, you know, at another time, I can give some perspective. Um, the problem I've got is that um, a lot of the documents no longer exist. So, I've got a few things, but and I've still got a contact with a couple people that were around uh, working in that area. But um, it's uh, unfortunately most of our key memory um, isn't with us anymore. Um, everybody from Don Brown. Right, and that was one of the challenges that I've come across time and time again when I think I get somewhere and. You know, oh, the, the pictures were thrown away or, you know, I, every once in a while, there'll be a, a small grouping of pictures like as camps being built, put together. Um, and again, I took that information off of 50 pages of sure. faxes yeah. and letters. And it's actually pretty neat to read through the whole thing um, that, that is all there. And most of these were letters written back and forth to um, from the, the scout executives from 68 through that time. Um, to the various camping committees, and then were actual reports presented to uh, the executive committee uh, for their recommendations. So, um, but well, the document itself is actually pretty cool. It's, yeah. it's great. Um, and we'll talk another time. Get in touch with me. And, That'd be great. Uh, we, can, yeah. uh, we can do some more, some documentation. Um, there is one key person. Um, that's still alive from that era, other than me. Um, uh, and, and I think maybe we can get him uh, to share some memories too. I think it'd be great if the two of you really got together and, and I know there's a lot of information that we'd all love to, to know. I'm sure the Seven Range staff would like to know that, but I know a lot of us you know, from Tuscaloosa and Buckeye would love to hear it too um, and be able to connect the dots between, between here and there. I think it's great. Um, uh, just back to Dave Durrell, one of the other things that Dave did in the last couple of years was he, he took uh, van loads of staff members over on a weekly basis 
um, to to the tree farm before it was obviously the camp. And Kevin will remember this, and Jan Klein is here too. Remember that too. Uh, we spent hours walking around the camp, and um, at one point in time, it was sort of staked out areas that they felt would be campsite areas and and whatnot. So we got to go through and look at it and see it. Um, the first year at Seven Ranges, intentionally, all the campsites were only uh, numbered. They only had numbers. They didn't have names um, because one of the traditions we wanted to do was to allow the, the troops that were camping in camp that first summer to make suggestions um, for what their campsite name should be. Um, and so most of the names um, that are there now came as a result. So it's kind of fun for some of us who were there for the first year because when we came back as campers later on, all of a sudden, all the numbered campsites had names. So we had to learn a whole bunch of new names. Um, we do have uh, you know, about five minutes or so on this particular uh, topic and area, and I wanted to kind of turn it over to some of the uh, seven range staffers here and see if you had things you wanted to add to this or questions that you wanted to, to ask um, that we could all learn from. So uh, Jan, Jan Klein has his hand up. Yes, and uh, that, Brian, is actually what, uh, what I wanted to know. Uh, my, um, I actually got my vigil before the camp was open. There was one year, at least one year, that uh, Order of the Arrow had that, uh, that used seven ranges before it was like uh, somewhere in the 80s. Um, and what I want to know is when the camp moved, what was that first 10 years like? Who's a, who, who of you were around those 10 years? What changed? What, you know, it was planned to have uh, uh, this group here and now they're on the other side. If you, you had to move that program area completely around to the other side. You know, is the chapel still where it was? Is handicraft still where it was planned at first? Those, you know, what, what did you have to adapt to? Those are the stories that I'm kind of interested in to hear. I can answer how'd make something. How'd you make something out of it, you know? Sure, I can answer a couple questions. The chapel um, wasn't built the first year, it was built, uh, my dad designed it. Um, and there's a little story behind that too, because the chapel sits sideways along the lake, but it was meant to be turned the other way. Uh, and uh, when they excavated, they, they did it wrong. And by the time he found out about it, they were already uh, pouring the footer for it. So it, it stayed where it was. <laughs> um, but uh, Kevin Powell, you, you spent, uh, you know, you, you went out there for the first year, but you, you spent a lot more years there. Maybe you can answer some of those questions in the first 10 years. Uh, maybe some of them, but uh, I spent an awful lot of time in the kitchen. <laughs> Brella always accused us, accused us of living in our own little world. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I don't know if I'm going to be a lot of help on those questions. Uh, okay. Well, I know that the, the original, dine, original uh, tool shed and uh, trading post were uh, not where they are now. They were... Um, to the as you're standing in the dining hall they were on, on the hill to the left past the green bar area there uh, and the uh there was a fire and the original uh trading trading post burned down um, that was 90 that was 1993 uh that was week three on uh, wednesday night or thursday morning at about 4 13 in the morning I want to stop, stop talking for a second here, Ben. Then I'm going to stop here because we have another family conversation going on that's coming through over. So, uh, is, can is everybody can everybody mute themselves? Hello. Can anybody identify who's? Uh... Okay, I'm, I'm going to randomly try to mute people to see if I can uh, figure out where this is coming from. Hey, Ben, it might be your background. Since you got headphones on, you probably can't hear it. I don't have anybody, there's nobody in my house with me, so it's not, oh, there you go. Brian, body, is that you? Okay. Oh, did, it, did it go away or is it, is it my background and I can't tell with the headphones? I figured it was muted. I think it's you, Ben. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. It was Ben. Okay. Brian, I can, I can yeah, answer Mark. part of Jan's questions. There were, were a couple things. Um, the, the thought was always that much like where the chapel wasn't oriented right, the camp office also was not oriented correctly um, because the back of the building is what faces the parking lot and the front of the building faces the woods and it was supposed to have been turned, I, I want to say a good 90 degrees or better so that you could see vehicles coming through the camp. Um, but it was never oriented correctly and that's why that building 
is so awkward in terms of what's the front and what's the back. Um, the same way originally the dining hall was supposed to be where the trading post is today on that hillside. Uh, and so the staff site I thought was unlike Tuscaloosa, where the staff was spread out was to put the staff all together um, close to the dining hall. Uh, and so what is known as Magic Mountain was originally the staff site. And that's why there's a, a shower house facility up there. There was uh, originally only one campsite uh, up there. Uh, when the dining hall got moved, they never moved the staff site. Uh, and so it made it very unbearable and, and just downright tedious uh, to try to go to bed at night. Because uh, once you went to the staff site, you were, you were done. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, trying to get up in the morning, you thought getting to the dining hall without Brad Bowersock seeing you sneak in late was, was hard at Tuscazor. Uh, there was no coming late at, at Seven Ranges uh, with the staff site being so far away. I'm going to jump in here on you, Mark, because uh, if, if, uh, uh, if Bob Schwartz are here to tell you this, we also, since we were all up on Magic Mountain in the same site, uh, late at night, we used to take the camp truck up and drive it out there and shine the lights out over the edge, and we would drive golf balls uh, and try to see if they could uh, drive them down to the dining hall, and campers would find the golf balls each day, and they would say, we found the golf balls, and we made up a story about there being a driving range a couple miles down the road and some pro hitting balls over, and we would... Uh, we'd give him a nickel for the golf ball to return to us. So Rick used to, Rick Weber used to bring him from his, uh, his uncle's driving range. So. I recall you know, driving a few of those not very far from up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then you know, the staff site uh, got turned into Magic Mountain the year we used that area for uh, a program skit uh, and, and sort of reconstructed the, the magic theme that we did one year at Tuscazor. And uh, sort of the same is true with the amphitheater uh, in the, the Bridge Builders Amphitheater. Um, part of the idea of that staging was to put a brick floor in uh, with the fire rings on either side, replicating a little bit of what uh, was at the Hoover Lodge Amphitheater. Uh, and then the reason the brick was there and not poured cement was so that if we ever wanted to change it, or quite frankly, the year we did the magic thing, we tunneled under um, the stage uh, into the back of the stage area, if you would recall, uh, so that the staff would come out of the magic uh, box. Uh, so we wanted to have that opportunity for, for the staff to do as well. Uh, and we also went through several uh, summers where we did fairly large banners uh, as part of the Sunday night program. Uh, one of which you may recall the banner on top of Hoover Lodge that redirected everybody's attention to the back of the lodge uh, with the banner and, and playing taps as part of the closing campfire. We replicated that uh, same aspect uh, the first couple summers at Seven Ranges, uh, and, but there were no poles or anything there, so that's where we had to put the poles in. I think there may still be, be some of those. Uh, somewhere along the line, the, the need to redo those fire, uh, uh, fire rings uh, is there because uh, I guess in, in sort of the same way that uh, George Deaver may have acquired a cannon, that was how some of that brick was acquired. <laughs> on those, on that uh, the uh, campfire area, Mark. One of the things we did in that original year, um, our our camp doctor was also a, a photographer. Um, so remember, this is back in '87, so digital wasn't the thing. And uh, every Sunday when the kids checked in, he would go around and take dozens and dozens, hundreds of pictures, and he would develop the pictures over the afternoon and during dinner into slides. And at the campfire that night. Um, towards the end of the campfire, they would see their own faces being projected on one of the screens as they, as they uh, during the campfire, so they could see themselves checking in. One of our, our big questions, one of our big themes was that, that uh, you know, we all love Tuscazora as a land, but what really makes it a camp is the, the people and the memories and, and what we do with it, and, and that they're very much, very much a part of that as, as, as the history of the camp. And so our program tied in the history of, the, of Carroll County with the current history and ended up with them seeing themselves up on the screen. Um, so it was kind of a way to, uh, to get them to really take ownership and possession of the camp from the very first year. Part of the conversation last night was about uh, Thunderbird Hill and, and Pioneer Point. Um, and in those first uh, years, uh, Thunderbird Hill really did not have a good view 
um, as high as the point was, you couldn't see much because of the undergrowth and the trees. Uh, and so we had a lot of uh, staff evenings, typically on Thursday night, where we just went up and started cutting and clearing, uh, intentionally leaving the three pine trees that um, Mike Deaver talks about uh, as part of, of, of the talk and what could those three pine trees represent. Uh, so that, that was part of that original intention from uh, you know, camp in, the, in 87, 88, when we cleared all that, to leave those trees so that others could talk about them in the future. Uh, so I'm always glad to, to see that part of, of uh, that legacy and uh, maybe some need to, to do that again at some point. Good. Uh, Andy had his hand up again. Sorry, Andy, it's been a while. You're still, still with us there? Yeah, I am. It's not a problem. I don't mean to be so like annoying constantly asking questions, but yeah, you were talking about the transition and I was wondering if, I think this is you, Brian, didn't you write the alma mater? I was wondering how that came to be. No, actually that was uh, Kevin Powell and, and Dave Wagner. And we, we mentioned that in the last night that we actually, we didn't want to have an alma mater in the first few years because we thought it'd be forced. We wanted people to really, uh, you know, we could never replace, we didn't want to replace the Tuscas or him. Um, but that was that Tesla him was was written in the 50s. I think uh, Sennheiser wrote it in the in the 50s. So it wasn't always the alma mater, and we felt that the alma mater for Seven Ranges had to develop on its own, or at least after uh, people had a chance to camp in the place and get a feel for it. So it wasn't until I think Kevin like four four years into the into uh, Seven Ranges that you and Dave finally put that song together. Is that right? Yeah, and I'm going to be honest. Uh, a huge part of it was Dave, but. Uh... I think it was the 90, 91 era that was put together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was, yeah, about four years. Okay. Did that answer your question, Andy? Yes, I did. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I just want to give it just a few more minutes uh, on this. Um, we, we're kind of into our, in our next section here. Um, but I wanted to find out if there are any more final thoughts from our, our seven range uh, gentlemen um, of traditions and histories and questions. Maybe one, one more question or one more uh, point to bring up before we move on to our next section. Anybody from the seven range group? I do have a question. It doesn't concern traditions, but I've heard a rumor uh, that there is a bat cave somewhere on camp property. Can anyone speak to that? A bat cave? Yes. I am Batman. <laughs> it might have been somebody pulling my leg. However, it's coming from a camp director, uh, and he was very adamant about it. So there, there is a cave I know, I never heard of the original it. property maps. I know where the bat cave was. The bat cave was beside the dining hall in a group of trees, and um, waiting for the Monday fire drill. Houlihan Schwartz myself and a couple other people would go under that clump of trees and make like little villages and they called it the bat cave uh-huh uh-huh uh jared you had your hand up or you're going to address that as well um i i actually had a question about on uh, a saturday morning tradition but if somebody has the end if somebody wants to elaborate more on the bat cave then i want to do that. Well, I, I think we can take one more question. I think uh, Uncle Ricky here answered our question. There you go, Rick. So go ahead, ask your question. Um, so Saturday mornings, as uh, I, I worked, I've worked at Seven Ranges the last decade, 2014, 2018, and um, Saturday mornings when we're doing, uh, when we're singing our alma mater and all the staff start to file down the stairs onto the parade grounds and stand um, basically everyone at a flagpole. And at the end, the campers come down and say goodbye and shake our hands and uh, give us, you know, scouting appropriate hugs. It, has that been a tradition longer than the last decade or two? Was that something that happened at Tuscazor? Uh, yeah, I can answer that question. Um, it, it, it's a tradition at Tuscazor, we had the Tuscazor hymn, which was in three stanzas. And what used to happen, can't check out um, on Saturday was after lunch. We actually had breakfast and lunch. Um, and uh, then they checked out and left after that. And so Friday night, um, we would sing the first verse of the Tuscazor hymn in the dining hall. 
Saturday breakfast, we'd sing the first two verses. And then Sunday or Saturday lunch, we'd sing all three. And the last verse, during the last verse, the staff would walk out of the dining hall and would then line the, the trail um, path out of the dining hall and go down and, and line up in the, uh, the parade grounds. Um, and we'd finish it there. Um, and uh, so when, the, so the idea of, of seeing the campers out and, and being there to say goodbye was something that, that had been a part of, of uh, Tuscola tradition for as long as, as I've been there. And I, I started in the mid seventies. I'm sure it went beyond that or before that. And so it just seemed really natural when uh, they finally kind of established a camp song at, at Seven Ranges that the same tradition would, uh, would naturally carry over. I think uh, uh, there were enough guys there, Mark Miller, Kevin Powell, Dave Wagner, who were familiar with the Tuscaloosa tradition. So I have no doubt that that's kind of where it came from. Mark, does that sound pretty? Um, yeah. Um, it was the, the Saturday at lunch. It was the staff would walk out and any former staff would be invited to join the current staff right, right. as well as it's just part of the unity uh, with that. Um, and it broke off a little bit because you said we didn't do a hymn per se uh, and seven ranges was so much farther removed. It took people longer to travel, which is why we eliminated the, the lunch so people could get on the road sooner um, and staff could get home that much sooner because it just, it still took so much more time to clean up. Uh, everything at, at the much bigger dining hall. Sure. But, but yeah, that the, I think is part of where that was because uh, the other part of that, then after all of the goodbyes were done, we all flocked to the wall and sing uh, National Embalming School. Yes. <laughs> and then so led to a pool trip. Hey, Jarek, let me add into that. Um, so where you would be familiar with standing um, right underneath where the porch is today um, before expansion number one, um, there was nothing more than a small little porta cache, just a small little porch, concrete pad, and uh, railroad timbers that lined all the way through there. Duder, you probably have a really good picture because there's a picture you pointing at Will, uh, yep. probably one of those Saturday mornings with that. Um, but that's where the staff would exit out that front section of the dining hall, and the staff would all line on and stand up on those railroad ties, and everybody exited out that way and would say goodbye from there. Excellent. That was before the, that was before the first expansion, right? Yeah, that was uh, when the dining hall was much, much smaller. And then uh, when expansion one hit, because then they took our hill down, because once everybody was uh, kind of done, uh, we would do the Saturday morning staff roll, which means you rolled down the hill. Um, and remember <laughs> getting up quite dizzy many a times from rolling down that hill, um, because you'd roll down to the road and then jump up and head to the parade grounds. Um, I'm just making yeah. sure because I didn't see the I didn't see the dining hall before the first expansion because my first year out there was camp was 03. Right. Oh, no, oh, cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, uh, I'm going to do one more. John Reese has his hand up. We'll do one more, and then we're going to move into our next section. So, John, what was your question? Yeah, my question is, how the heck did I ever get hired? I could not sing, and everybody else could. Well, we need somebody to make the rest of us look better. We added that to the interview the year after you joined. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how did actually, our horse get past it then? Actually, uh -oh. I got kicked out of choir in junior high or high school. I can't remember. Uh -huh. But uh, I could not say. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you for answering. I remember. That. Well, I must not have been able to sing either. They gave me a bucket medal because I couldn't. Um, you know, carry a tune in a bucket. I still have that metal around here somewhere. Um, we're gonna, I know there's a, a, a lot more discussion here, but um, our original intention was to, to break up at this point in time into three different